Have you ever witnessed the unmistakable orchestration of destiny, where heaven intricately arranges the deck of cards in your life? It fabricates situations and encounters that fulfill your deepest desires, manifest vague expectations, and provide long-awaited answers to the questions that haunt your soul. When we open our hearts to the universe, aligning our most profound desires with the laws of heaven, everything around us harmoniously falls into place, as if attuned to our subtle vibrations. One day, consumed by loneliness and boredom, I ventured into the realm of online dating. Placing my profile on a dating site, I did so without expecting anyone to pay it any attention. Yet in the midst of my indifference, a letter unexpectedly found its way into my mailbox. Hi, it's me, and who are you? He wrote, accompanied by a photograph depicting a serene riverbank, where willows dipped their branches into the water, and cozy little houses adorned the riverside. The landscape felt familiar, resonating with a lyrical charm that echoed the depths of my being. Curiosity piqued, I responded, and who are you? With a surprising yet sympathetic tone, captivated by the beauty of the riverbank he shared. I'm Andri, residing in Moscow, and you? He replied, commencing our acquaintance. Swift and profound, our virtual conversations began at twilight and stretched until dawn's early light. He called again in the morning and we conversed until the approaching noon. It was then that I made a spontaneous decision, purchasing a train ticket to Moscow. Crazy, my mother remarked, unable to comprehend my impulsive actions. But deep down, I acknowledged my own brand of madness. I was unable to resist the invisible force that drew me towards him. Perhaps a subtle astral communication burst an irresistible attraction, as some psychics might suggest. Whatever it was, it surpassed reason, common sense, and my own comprehension. It felt as though the heavens had ordained our meeting, an encounter that had to transpire at any cost. Andre, as I discovered, was an artist. Perhaps individuals with the ability to weave fantasies possess an innate connection, understanding one another on a realm beyond ordinary consciousness. I cannot say for certain. Although we didn't have the opportunity to explore Moscow together as promised, our conversations filled every moment. Subsequently, I returned home, brimming with his essence like a magical vessel. He embodied the essence of a true artist, perceptive yet somewhat absent-minded, residing in his own inner dimension. Energy coursed through his veins, accompanied by concealed pain, a tinge of loneliness, and an impulsive surge of passion. Living alone, he carried the scars of a shattered family, a subject we mutually avoided. Andre fervently spoke about politics, Russia's fate, the gradual demise of rural life and the country as a whole. He believed that Russia was ensnared in a delicate web of invisible enemy propaganda, attempting to mold its people into mindless pawns, serving a nefarious will. I longed to engage in debate, yet his frustration often resulted in irritability, overshadowing any attempt to challenge his perspectives. Thus, I remained silent, feeling the depths of his disillusionment, the pain that resided within him, and the bitterness stemming from his inability to effect change in this chaotic world. I could sense it, understand it. It was during this time that he proposed an idea, for me to write a book about him as part of the Great Artist series. Having been absent from the art world for a decade, he sought a rebirth, a chance to promote himself and thrive in the vast marketplace of talent. Why did he choose me, I wondered? Perhaps due to my own haphazard existence and the disorder that encumbered my life. Regardless, I found pride in his decision. Although I had never written a book, let alone one about artists, 
Faint dreams and aspirations had often wandered through my mind since childhood. But as a writer, what could I truly claim to be? I only dabbled in writing for women's magazines and once embarked on a never-ending, tiresome love novel. Yet time was not on my side, as I had to deliver the completed manuscript to the publisher by January, lest I fall behind more agile competitors. Thus, the work began. We referred to it as distance work, for I couldn't be physically present, and the looming deadline necessitated an alternative approach. He would recount his childhood memories, adolescent experiences, and insights into art and life over the phone. Being a novice in the realm of painting, I made numerous professional errors, causing my poor artist to spend a small fortune on phone calls. Nevertheless, I managed to complete the book within the allotted time. I believe he was content with the result, especially given the absence of other options. A month later, he implored me to visit Moscow, correct any remaining mistakes, and refine the book's style. Come here, I'll provide the payment for the book. Together, we shall read it one last time. I've missed you. His voice crackled with excitement through the phone. In that moment, I felt the space between us constricting, awaiting my decision. While writing, I had fallen in love with this sweet, enigmatic, solitary artist with his tumultuous nature. Walking alongside him through the intricate steps of his journey, I recognized the profound resonance within his being. Yet my heart ached with the knowledge that I couldn't bring him lasting happiness. I, too, yearned for his presence, longing to rekindle the profound sense of belonging and intimacy I had experienced during the month of writing about him. The evening train rattled its wheels, casting a rhythmic symphony against the backdrop of winter dusk and flickering city lights. My heart raced as I made my way to Moscow, where the hero of my book awaited. Excitement coursed through my soul, even though we had parted as friends, without promises or grudges, knowing that love could never bloom between us, as each of us had our own paths to follow. Yet, why did my soul ache so tenderly? After persistent calls, the door to his studio finally opened revealing a pale and unhappy face. This was not the ideal meeting I had envisioned with my hero. I'm sorry, I'm not awake yet. I couldn't sleep till four o'clock yesterday. I had a lot of stupid thoughts, he apologized, inviting me into the room. Sketches lay in disarray on the bed, while paintings leaned against the walls, forming a chaotic backdrop to the life of a solitary artist. It felt as if I had been here just yesterday, yet everything appeared different through my newly opened eyes. A pang of longing reverberated within me, as if someone tugged at the strings of my inner being, preparing to release it in a crescendo of creative triumph. But the invisible conductor hesitated, pulling at the strings, causing me pain. We talked for a while, I brought him warm woolen socks and a Ukrainian amulet, a souvenir from the Carpathians. However, he dismissed them, declaring his disbelief in such nonsense. Instead, he delved into a lengthy debate about God, the Bible, and the historical suffering of Moses and the Jews. These intellectually stimulating conversations, infused with literature and art, held a captivating allure. Yet, I understood that they served as a shield, protecting him from the inner torment that kept him awake. His vulnerability and openness, which were now accessible to me, felt as though he was attuning himself to my wavelength, reading my soul as I read his. It was a state that defied easy description. We postponed reading the book, as if intentionally delaying the mundane task. Perhaps we were apprehensive about altering what we had conjured and reimagined on paper during our clandestine soul-to-soul -soul communion. Today, he awaited potential buyers. Selling his paintings was no easy feat for an artist. 
It meant relinquishing them from his heart, like parting with cherished children, those long-suffering creations that had absorbed the pains and joys of past moments. He worried, for the next six months of his life, hinged on the outcome of today's sales. It would determine the trajectory of his artistic exploration. How could he navigate the conversation with art dealers to maintain his position? What could he offer them? He appeared bewildered, anxious, and utterly unrepresentable. A torn button adorned his shirt, his jacket sleeves bore the stains of paint, and his hair was disheveled. You need to tidy yourself up so that your customers will perceive you as a normal, well-groomed, and affluent man who engages in art as a leisurely pursuit or out of pure love. Let me iron your shirt for you. Do you have a clean one? I offered. Alas, there was no clean shirt, nor was there a replacement button. Among the crumpled clothes on the bottom shelf of his closet, we discovered a few wrinkled and worn shirts. We attempted to restore their semblance of tidiness. Subsequently, he sent me to the store to fetch groceries, as he couldn't leave the house while awaiting potential buyers, and hunger gnawed him since the previous night. My heart ached with compassion. I imagined his daily routine, unintentionally contemplating the difficulty of living alone as a solitary and absent-minded artist. As I boiled potatoes and washed shirts, customers arrived, yet none made a purchase. Despondency enveloped him, impossible to conceal. There was nothing I could do to alleviate his melancholy. Soon, my train would carry me to Kiev, where my two children and sick mother awaited, and the burden of loneliness mirrored his own. Neither of us possessed the power to alter this predicament. I sensed his weariness with life, as if something within him had snapped, tarnishing the vibrant memories of his childhood that he had once painted so vividly on canvas. Disappointment and fatigue cast a hazy shadow, growing increasingly challenging to overcome. Find me a young girl. I'll start afresh. I'll raise her according to my own ideals as my soulmate. I want her to give me many children. I adore children so deeply. My daughters are in the first grade, he suddenly exclaimed, catching me off guard. I was at a loss for words. You can't start anew. You can only continue. A young girl must love you and understand you, or she'll become another version of your ex-wife. You don't need just any girl. You need love. I replied gently. I'll save it for a special occasion, he said sadly, looking at me intently. Every day is a special occasion, I whispered softly. To divert our thoughts from sorrowful matters, we immersed ourselves in reading. Slowly but steadily, the work progressed. Writing about a person based solely on telephone conversations allowed ample room for error, but surprisingly, there weren't many. We became engrossed, engaging in discussions as if we had transcended the weight of inner pain that had haunted us since our initial encounter. Oh, the lamentable reality that compels artists to divert their focus from painting and immersing themselves in a world of fantasies and imagery to the arduous task of selling their art and navigating the art market. Negotiating prices and parting with the dearest offspring of their talent. The studio felt chilly. He occasionally clutched his side and dabbed it with cologne to provide warmth. It seemed he sought in vain to capture the warm sense of happiness that hovered over the screen as I read about his childhood memories. At first, he sat with his back against the couch, then paced the room, and finally he opened the window. Suddenly he leaped up, grabbing a painting from the wall, along with a brush, and hurried from the room into the studio, where clouds beckoned him with their vivid allure, with delicate strokes, he applied paint, his head turned towards my voice, listening to the reading. Weary of shouting from the adjacent room, I ventured into the studio, where paintings prepared for viewing adorned the walls, 
A jumbled display. I was awestruck. How had I not noticed it before? There, on the sketchbook, lay a painting infused with shades of pink. He was explaining something to me, offering guidance on how to bring the sky to life with vibrant brushstrokes. Yet, I hardly listened, captivated and subdued by the exquisite fragment of happiness captured on canvas. Winter's twilight delicately caressed the snow-covered valleys, casting gentle shadows upon fences, houses, and snowdrifts. A small but radiant slice of Russian village life emerged. In the vegetable garden near the fence stood a scarecrow, donned in a sheepskin coat, its shiny tin bucket head reflecting the meager rays of an invisible sun. A boy stood beside the fence, gazing dreamily into the distance. However, that wasn't the main focal point. The painting exuded a magical hue of pink, as if the artist had seized the fleeting transition between day and night. The sun enveloped everything in its tender warmth, imbuing the ephemeral moment of pink bliss with timeless significance on the canvas. I adore it as well, he murmured softly, drawing closer. I gently caressed his head and pressed my cheek against his. It's truly magnificent, I whispered, feeling a surge of desire emanating from him. Fairly contained and ardent, the longing to love and be loved, Every moment of our lives is extraordinary, I pondered silently. I am grateful that you allowed me to touch your soul, you, the artist of the vanishing Russian village, with your wispy white hair and lively eyes. I am enamored with your thoughts and your paintings. I have fallen in love with your dreams and your pain, stemming from the elusive harmony of life. Your passion for your work and your burning desire to write, I sense the abundance of love for life that resides within your heart. I am in love with you, you wild artist, and I ache for you, for your restlessness, and the absence of a beloved woman who would warm, nourish, and soothe your troubled soul. If only I could intercede in the celestial order and shape life according to the dictates of my soul. I would be there for you. Who knows? Perhaps you are my soulmate. In 40 minutes, I will be gone, and we will not have time to revise the final chapters of the little book, chronicling the fate of a country boy who dared to become a Moscow artist. No one else will read it anyway, you said in parting. But what does it matter? I wrote it for myself, and it brought me happiness. The sound of the wheels muffles my silent tears for life, its monstrous injustice, and the fact that I cannot be with you because each of us has our own path, and the railroad, with its straight tracks leading to chosen destinations, has a knack for dividing us across towns and cities. Strictly adhering to its schedule, tomorrow morning will arrive, and you will awaken feeling stronger, as a rosy dream of summer and love lingers in your thoughts. The pain in your side and your heart will fade into insignificance. I know that one day, somewhere on the precipice of our imaginations, we will meet in clasping each other's hands, trustingly unite our souls. It will be beautiful. It will feel inexplicably right. And as the winter morning rushes past the train window, it will appear pink much like the evening captured in our cherished painting. Thank you for watching. I hope it was interesting. See you in the next story. Goodbye.